from the China and does not stimulate pancreatic exocrine secretion. And he thought of the potential use in diabetes at that time. And Heller, who was Austrian, believed that his extract, which he called duodenum, would affect an augmentation and restitution of islet cells. So affect the integrity of the pancreatic islet cell, which is something we're still trying to prove. So that was all going pretty well. And then we come to the so-called dark years of in Cretan research. So in 1939, Lou, Gray and Ivy, and Ivy was a very, very prominent American physiologist. He discovered cholecystokinin, and they had three papers published in American Journal of Physiology and they suggested that in these papers, extracts of intestinal mucosa had no effect on blood glucose in dogs. And it was a very big negative. There was widespread publicity. And Morton Grossman, who a major physiologist, who was in fact Ivy was Grossman's mentor, wrote a 60-page article in Physiological Reviews in 1950 really condemning the concept until more convincing evidence has been presented for the hypoglycemic activity of intestinal extracts or the effect of duodenal stimulation on blood sugar levels, the existence of a duodenal hormone for the regulation of sugar metabolism must be considered questionable. And then, after we must remember, after Ivy's experiments, there was the war, and that wasn't good for research. Now, what did Lowe and Grossman not recognise, and these are fundamental concepts. Firstly, that an increment must lower the blood glucose in physiological plasma concentrations via stimulation of insulin secretion, so it wasn't direct. Secondly, other gastrointestinal peptides do stimulate insulin, but only when given in vastly superphysiological plasma concentrations. There are a number of these, cholecystokinin, secretin, and gastrin amongst them. Importantly, the glucose-lowering effect of an incretin is glucose-dependent, so it will only occur when the blood glucose is elevated to at least, say, 8 millimoles per litre. And finally, that an incretin is released by nutrients in all cases, but only in some species by acid. So we move on to the 60s, radioimmunoassays for insulin and it all comes together. So in 1964, there were concurrent reports from both sides of the Atlantic. Elric, I think, from Denver, publishing JCM, and McIntyre from London in The Lancet, reported that oral glucose induced a greater insulin response than intravenous glucose, even if the intravenous glucose load was much greater. And this was followed in 1967 by Pearlie and Kipnis, suggesting that about 50% of the insulin secreted after an oral glucose load was released by gastrointestinal factors. In 1970, John Brown from Vancouver isolated GIP, and he called it gastric inhibitory polypeptide because it inhibited acid secretion. But together with John Dupre in 1973, he showed that GIP had insulinotrophic activities in humans and suggests that his name using still GIP was changed to glucose-dependent insulinotropic peptide. So we had our first incretin. <coughs> but there was a long gap for the second incretin, 1985, when the insulinotropic action of truncated GLP-1 was demonstrated. Michael Nauck in 1986 showed that the incretin effect was reduced in type 2 diabetes and then a paper in the Lancet from Steve Bloom's group showing that glucon light peptide 1 was a physiological incretin in humans. So it's been a long road to get that point, 1902. But we have this paper, this is Pearlie and Kipner, showing the incretin effect. 50 per 70% of the post glucose insulin secretion is due to the incretin effect. And that's an enormous effect. So we have this cartoon here, struck from behind or right, and from my first examination of the wound, I'd say this was done by some kind of heavy blunt object. So it's not a subtle thing. So why, staying from 1967 to the FDA releasing exenatide in 2005, 
about 40 years to translate an extraordinarily major clinical observation. And this has occurred because of the slower discovery of GLP-1 and issues of patents in the pharmaceutical industry. They're the two major factors. So if we come to the two incretin hormones, and I'll comment about their physiology and their release. So GIP is released proximally from the duodenum and jejunum predominantly, and GLP from L cells located much more distally, though there's some proximally, and predominantly in the ileum and also the colon. So the colon is a very rich source of GLP-1. And the patterns of release are quite different. So if we isolate a segment of proximal small intestine to 60 centimetres, and we infuse glucose at about the normal rate of gastric empty, you get no release of GLP-1 when it, there's, the whole segment is available, there's significant release. So release of GLP-1 is dependent on the length of small intestine exposed and also the region. In contrast, there's a prompt release in GIP and it's not length dependent. So the patterns of release in response to glucose are quite different. If we look at the effects of an artificial sweetener such as sucralose and you look at the effects on GIP and GLP-1 release, these are healthy subjects but the same is seen in type 2 patients, you get a profound increase in both in response to sucrose and sucralose at two concentrations has no effect on either GIP or GLP-1. But this does not mean that Carbohydrate has to be digested to stimulate incretins because the non-adjustable glucose analogue, 3-OMG, stimulates both GIP and GLP-1. We've talked about carbohydrate. It's not well recognised. Certainly in the case of GLP, fat is probably the most potent stimulus, more than carbohydrate. And this is dependent on digestion of fat to fatty acids. That's the equivalent of all a stat. When digestion of fat to fatty acids is inhibited, a duodenal fat infusion has no effect on GLP-1 release in contrast to the profound increase with the infusion without all a stat. So that's about patterns of release, but what are the molecular mechanisms? And the short answer is we don't know, but there's a clear link to so-called taste molecules, which are now characterised very well on the tongue and have very similar effects in the gut, and particularly a molecule called so-called alpha gastrucin. Now, in mice, if you get knockout mice for alpha gastrucin, they don't get a, and you give them a glucose load they don't get any significant GLP-1 response and their insulin response is quite different too. So in mice, taste signaling is strongly linked to GLP-1 secretion. Now, if we look at staining, taste molecules are also expressed in populations of GLP-1 immunoreactive epithelial cells. That's from the jejunum in mice. You can see the overlap between the cells. However, this is only a subset of cells. So it's clear that additional neurotransmitters are likely to be involved in alpha gastrucin signals. Now, I'm only talking about the GLP-1 response to glucose here. Similarly, this is a human biopsy of the duodenum. And you can see co-expression of these cells but again it's only a small number of which are also immunoreactive for GLP-1. So clearly there's alpha gastrucin in that one, GLP-1 in the same. So we don't know about the mechanisms of detection very well at all and this is an area of active research. The next thing is what is the relationship between duodenal glucose delivery, gastric emptying, and both glycemia and incretin hormone release. And these studies have got insights which are 
fundamental to the management of diabetes. Now, <clears throat> the human sub subject, the stomach empties nutrients at a rate of between one and four kilocalories per minute. And that's highly predictable in a given individual, very much reproducible, and the same occurs in type 2 patients. Overall, it's a little less because they can get gastroparesis. So in this study, in both healthy subjects and type 2 patients, we infused glucose intradunally at either 1, 2 or 4 kilocalories per minute or had a saline control. Ignore the meal diet, or I won't show that. Now, the logic for this is if you have a relationship between gastric empty of glucose and blood glucose response in healthy subjects, also type 2 patients, so this person is emptying at a rate of about one kilocalorie per minute if you calculate it, and this person is emptying at a rate of about four kilocalories per minute, and I thought the relationship was linear. But I think I'm wrong, and the relationship goes like that, as I'll show you. So we have a duodenal catheter with an infusion port directly positioned in the duodenum, and this is relatively non-invasive and comfortable. So these are the blood glucose results. So we either have control, one kilocalorie per minute, two kilocalories per minute, or four kilocalories per minute. Healthy subjects, type two patients. Now if I talk about the healthy subjects first, one kilocalorie per minute, modest rise in blood glucose. Two kilocalories, much more of a rise. But four kilocalories, no difference to two kilocalories. So it's a non-linear relationship. Similarly, in the type 2 patients, greater rises in blood glucose, but relatively modest rise for one kilocalorie per minute, only going from seven to eight millimoles per litre, much more of a rise to two kilocalories per minute, but if we double that, we only get a further very modest increase. So it's a non-linear relationship between duodenal glucose delivery and glycemia. And the implication is, if you happen to empty your stomach at less than one kilocalorie per minute, you probably won't get postprandial glycemia. Now, why is this so? And it's easy to see that when you look at the four kilocalorie per minute infusion in both the healthy subjects and the diabetics, there's a much greater insulin response to this than the lower loads. So why is there a greater insulin response? It's not GIP probably, because as I showed you, GIP, the glucose, hits the duodenum, rapid rise stays the same. So it's a linear increase. One, two, four. It goes up and stays the same. Similar response in the type 2 patient. Goes up, plateau, goes up, plateau, etc. So a linear GIP response. But this is what you see with GLP-1. It's interesting, when you infuse GLP-1, you get a tiny rise at about 15 minutes. And clearly at this time, the glucose can't have reached the terminal ileum. And there are a number of reasons for this, but it's transit. It goes up a bit, comes down. It looks a tiny effect, but it's consistent. But there's minimum GLP-1 response to the 1 and 2 glucose loads, but the 4 kilocalorie per minute load produce a dramatic and increasingly sustained GLP-1 response in both the healthy subjects and the type 2 patients. So the implication is the incretin response is of particular importance at higher rates of duodenal glucose delivery. And there's enormous range in gastric emptying in healthy subjects. So the normal individual who empties their glucose at four kilocalories per minute is much more dependent on an intact incretin response than the normal individual who empties their glucose at one kilocalorie per minute. Now, I was talking to Jonathan Shaw at the tea break about the implications for the glucose tolerance test of the diagnosis of diabetes. So to summarise that story, carbohydrate, fat, and I didn't mention it, but certainly also bile acids, a potent stimuli of incretin secretion. The mechanisms underlying GLP-1 and GIP secretion are poorly defined. The stimulation of GLP-1 but not GIP 
but enteral glucose is dependent on the length of intestine exposed and the relationship between small intestinal glucose delivery, meaning gastric emptying, is linear for the secretion of GIP and non-linear for GLP-1. People don't need to worry about photographing slides. Anyone who wants any slides can just email me and I'll send them to them. Okay, so if I hope that's reasonably clear. So the next phase is Michael Knapp's study, 1986 diabetologia, showing the incretin effect is diminished in patients with type 2 diabetes. So this compares the insulin response, intravenous glucose, oral glucose, and clearly there's much less of a difference in the type 2 patients. That's not a subtle observation. And Michael and Eurus Meyer, and Eurus is talking at this meeting, and I think you'll find him very impressive, who have postulated, well, this could really be an epiphenomenon rather than a direct effect of diabetes per se, because you see the same effect in different forms of diabetes and not in first-degree relatives. So they suggest there's a deficit in beta cell function, a reduced maximum insulin secretory capacity, leading to hyperglycemia, leading potentially to diminished GLP-1 secretion and reduced feedback of GIP receptors. And I'll show you some of that data. So a reduced increase in effect. And that was an article in Diabetes this year. So in general... Why is the incretin effect reduced in type 2 diabetes? And there are two choices. Is something wrong with the secretion of the incretin hormones or is something wrong with the action of the incretin hormones? Now, again, this is one of Michael Knapp's studies, 1986, showing that the GIP response is intact. So in control subjects and type 2 patients, there's no significant difference in the response to oral glucose and no GIP response, as you'd expect, to IV glucose. So the GIP secretion appears to be intact. Now, there are a number of papers, this is one from 2001, suggesting that the GLP-1 response was defective. And this measures both total and so-called intact GLP-1, <coughs> suggesting that the responses were less in type 2 patients. But, of course, they gave the glucose orally and that didn't account for differences in gastric emptying between the groups, which is probably the answer. A subsequent study in 2008 looked at patients with normal glucose tolerance, impaired glucose tolerance in type 2 patients, and looked at response to 75 grams of oral glucose and a test meal, and found very consistent observations of no difference in either GLP-1 or GIP secretion between the two groups. So overall, there's no evidence of impaired GIP or GLP secretion. Now we come to action, and again, this study showed clearly that the response to GLP-1 may be diminished a little, but is fundamentally intact as far as the stimulation of insulin. In contrast, the response to GIP in type 2 patients is dramatically attenuated with low and high doses of GIP. So GIP does not work in type 2 patients. Now, this is some data uh, from Michael Knapp, which he gave me, and it's unpublished, and I'll thank him for that. Uh, that's why they're white slides. And it shows that what happens if you add GIP to GLP-1? And the answer is nothing good. So this is type 2 patients, and you have GLP-1 by itself, lowering blood glucose, and the combination of GLP-1 and GIP does no better. GIP by itself has a very modest effect and a very modest stimulation of insulin. But the combination does no better in lowering blood glucose or stimulating insulin. And furthermore, if we look at the glucagon response, there's the lowering of glucagon by GLP-1 alone, and this is attenuated by GIP because GIP may actually stimulate glucagon. So there may be negative outback. Now, when you look at this study, bear in mind that the blood glucose levels were about 180, so about 10 millimoles per litre, and we may see something different if the blood glucose was lower because 
there's increasing evidence that the negative effects of GIP relate to hyperglycemia because we see it in other forms of diabetes, such as chronic pancreatitis, GLP-1 stimulates insulin, GIP does not, lean type 2s, etc. So it's not specific for type 2 diabetes. And then there are animal data which suggests that GIP receptors are affected grossly by what the blood glucose is, in fact, whether insulin is given or not. So there's this concept that if the fasting blood glucose is really greater than about 7 millimoles per litre or so, there is no insulin stimulation by exogenous GIP. With your healthy controls, first-degree relatives of patients with type 2 diabetes, women with gestational diabetes, <coughs> or patients with type 2 diabetes. So we may see more about GIP when issues of blood glucose are taken into account. So to summarise that section, GIP-1 has greater therapeutic potential than GIP for the treatment of type 2 diabetes. Both GIP and GLP-1 play a role in glucose homeostasis after nutrient ingestion. In fact, GIP may be the dominant in cretin in health. The cretin effect is diminished in patients with type 2 diabetes, markedly diminished, and GIP secretion is normal, but its action is markedly diminished, at least during hyperglycemia. And GLP-1 secretion is normal, and its action is relatively preserved. And therefore, Dan Drucker wrote appropriately in 2003, the development of agents based on the actions of GLP-1 is of great clinical interest. So the next story in this development was, can glycemia be normalised if incretin function is restored by exogenous GLP-1. And we know giving GIP won't help to that. So we have type 2 patients and they're given an intravenous infusion of GLP-1 and it normalises the blood glucose. It's a very important point. It just doesn't lower it. It basically makes it normal. And this is what you see with intravenous GLP-1, but you don't see it with subcutaneous GLP-1. And we don't know why. But intravenous GLP-1 will fundamentally normalise the blood glucose. Now, that's intravenous short-term. <coughs> and this was a seminal paper from Jens Holtz Group published in The Lancet, giving for a period of six weeks a subcutaneous infusion of GLP-1. And you can see there's marked glucose lowering, but the glucose is still 10 millimoles per litre. So you don't normalise the blood glucose by subcutaneous GLP-1 or the analogues. So it's got clear therapeutic relevance. So that all looks pretty good. But then the question, is GLP-1 a physiological incretin hormone? So we have this concept of incretins regulating glucose homeostasis for effects on the alpha or beta cell to stimulate insulin and suppress glucagon and that all of these effects are dependent on the blood glucose. So essentially you need a blood glucose of greater than about 8 millimoles per litre for this to occur. And in contrast to GLP-1, an important fact is GIP has the capacity to stimulate glucagon. And this is logical. It's the same mechanism by which probably it stimulates insulin. And in fact, it's very strange that GLP-1 lowers glucagon, and this is probably an indirect effect via somatostatin. So, this is Werner Kreutzfeld, who was instrumental to the whole in Cretan story, the discoverer, really, of GLP-1, and his definition of an in Cretan. This is an extract from his Claude Bernard lecture at the EASD in 1978. And he said, an endocrine neurotransmitter produced by the gut, which is A, released by nutrients, especially carbohydrates, and B, stimulates insulin secretion in the presence of glucose if exogenously effused in amounts not exceeding blood levels achievable after food. Okay. Now, as I said, the normal stomach empties at between 1 and 4 kilocalories per minute. So for practical purpose, 
we are spending the majority of our lives if we eat more than 2,000 calories in the postprandial or postabsorptive state. And the only time there's true fasting is probably four or five hours before breakfast. So when we measure so-called fasting blood glucose levels in our patient at other times of the day, they are not fasting blood glucose levels. Now, you can assess the effects of GLP-1 using a specific antagonist, Excendant 9 to 39. And this has shown that GLP-1 is a physiological modulator.